When you visit Arizona, time is measured in moments, not minutes. Like the moment your work stress disappears as you kayak through the canyons. Or the moment you discover the life-changing effects of prickly pear chocolate. But nothing beats the moment you see the Grand Canyon for the very first time. Visit a new state of mind. Learn more at hereyouareaz.com. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello, once again. Thank you for joining us. This is the Space Nuts podcast, episode 253. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and joining me as always, our super special interstellar guest and <laughs> colleague and friend, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hey. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. How are you going? I You're am a... quite well, thank yes, you. Yes, you look you? very well. Yeah, I'm all right, thanks. Yep, yeah, all good. You do too. Like, yeah, like so the... Um, is that a polo neck, the polo neck um, sweater? Yeah, I'd have called it that. Um, I don't think, I don't know what they call it here. It goes, uh, the, I think um, I think it's technically a skivvy in Australia. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, I used to wear those as a kid. I hated yeah. them. It's like, yeah. you know, I might as well wear a noose. <laughs> but I have a rather large neck. I went to a chiropractor once and he said, you've got the biggest neck I've ever seen. And I thought, <laughs> gee, that's nice. I mean, it doesn't look abnormal to me. I think he meant in terms of length. Yeah, maybe. It, go, yeah. it goes from here to here. That's a long one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It gives me a lot of trouble, that's all I know. Got always got neck pain. Anyway, yeah. that's another yeah. story. No, another I, story. But I, I, you know, we've got an hour. I can tell the whole thing if you like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, let's not. Uh, and uh, we will, though, be talking about China uh, successfully landing on Mars and they're about to roll off their... Um, uh, their new MG. No, hang on. It's a rover. I'm not sure what model, though. But uh, we will uh, be talking about that. And uh, I'm fascinated by this story. One of the things we've been talking about a lot in recent times is dark matter and dark energy. And, of course, we've also been talking about the uh, the expansion of the universe, but we don't know why it's expanding at a, a faster and faster rate. But now some new modelling suggests maybe we've got an answer and it's a new form or an undiscovered yet form of dark energy. Maybe. Maybe that's the answer. Plus, we'll uh, tackle some questions. Uh, we've got one from Kansas and one from Western Australia. So we'll get into those a little later. Uh, they're text questions. We've been... We've, I know we love the audio questions, but we can't, we can't ignore our typing fraternity. So we will be answering a couple of your questions. But first, Fred, let us um, talk about China's mission to Mars. They touched down late last week very successfully, uh, and now they're, uh, they're gearing up to, um, to, to roll that rover out on Utopia Planitia. I love yeah. the names of places on Mars. <laughs> I love them. They're great, aren't they? And mm. uh, the, 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 I think the names of Chinese spacecraft are great as well. Zhurong is, the, is the name of the of the rover, which is apparently a fire god in uh, Chinese culture. I might be pronouncing it incorrectly, and I do apologise for Chinese speakers, two Chinese speakers if I am. Um, and the other thing to say is that this news might be out of date by the time people listen. Uh, but the most, yes, you're quite right, the um, spacecraft got down safely last weekend. A absolute triumph for the China National Space Administration. Uh, it is stunning that they've put this ambitious program together of a, an orbiter, a lander and a rover. And so far, everything has gone absolutely smoothly. They've touched down successfully on the surface with a, uh, a, a essentially a technology not that different from uh, the way Perseverance landed, except they didn't use a sky crane. They, the lander itself has a rocket motor uh, down uh, on, on its underneath, and that's used to um, that is used to to slow it down, uh, as well as parachutes and the aeroshell, the usual stuff for slowing it down high in the atmosphere. But everything worked swimmingly. It is fantastic news that the spacecraft is there. Um, one thing we might look out for is uh, images from 
HiRISE, which is the high resolution camera on board Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, a NASA, a NASA orbiter, uh, mm. that will almost certainly eventually send us back a picture of Zhirong sitting on the surface. Um, the the news this weekend, though, which hasn't come yet, but we're looking forward to, is that uh, either Saturday or Sunday, uh, the uh, is it the twenty second or twenty third? I guess is that, uh, that the the date? Well, what, Sorry, what 20, I'm reading. What it's I'm Friday, or Friday or Saturday. Yeah, 21st, 21st or 22nd. 22nd. That's right. Yeah, uh, Friday or Saturday. Uh, we expect uh, the the lander's ramps to come down, mm-hmm. uh, and the uh, the the rover to trundle down the uh, the ramps and start its work on the surface. I'm sure they're doing this all with great caution, as you would expect, because yeah. uh, it's uh, it's something that nobody wants to get wrong. Uh, we've got this time delay with signals to and from Mars. I can't remember what it is at the moment, but it's usually uh, as it's, it can be as long as twenty minutes. It's usually shorter than that. Um, mm. The lander, the rover weighs a quarter of a ton. It's uh, you know not a not a not a minuscule thing. Uh, it's got uh, solar panels, which I think um, may already be unfolded. They were folded up for the landing. I'm not sure what the status of those is. Uh, they probably got... need to warm it up, don't they? Literally warm it up. Yeah, that's right. Get, get the batteries. Uh, so charged. I would guess that would that would be the first thing that that they'd do probably when it touched down. And of course, that was the step in which the Beagle Two lander uh, failed back in 2003, was it? When it touched down successfully on the surface, but the solar panels didn't properly un, un, unfurl. And if if you that... could get over to Beagle and and. You know, just reef them open. Would it suddenly come to life, or would it be th- a dead dog by now? Yeah, or, or- I think the the problem is. I mean, it is what's it, eight or nine years ago since that it's been on the surface, uh, and the problem is the electronics tend to to freeze uh, and don't recover at the sorts uh, of temperatures that you can get during the Martian the Martian night. They they don't like being that cold, and when you warm them up again, they just say, "Nah." Computer says mm-hmm. no. So. <laughs> Yeah. I love that. Uh, so all those science fiction films I've watched about them, you know, finding an old rover and, and reigniting it to escape the planet or what, no go. They are science fiction, that's right. Yes. yes. Um, know all about that. Yeah, you do, I know. You know more about it than I do anyway. Uh, so a three-month program for uh, for Jurong, um, and it will do some really interesting things, including uh, sensing the magnetic field, the local magnetic field. I think I mentioned this last time, Andrew. Yeah. It has a magnetometer, which is, I think, the first time one has been sent to the surface. The orbiter itself, Tianwen-1, uh, will stay uh, operational for about two Earth years, which is kind of one Mars year, uh, and will will do many things. I mean, in the short term, it's it's uh, acting as a, a relay station for Jurong. And we believe, I think um, I got the news that uh, it, it w- was within the last couple of days, its orbit has been lowered to be uh, near the surface of the planet. So it can pick up the signals from Jurong more easily because mm. uh, it had a quite a high orbit before it's come down in height uh, and will do that work. But it will continue for, as I said, a full Martian year uh, to, to, to gather data, to image the surface uh, and generally do good stuff about Mars, which we will find out about, I'm sure. Uh, because, I hope uh, this so. Is the, I mean, this, yeah. when you... When you look at sort of on Earth relationships between China and other countries, they you know they've been pretty dicey in recent times. But I would hope that when it comes to exploration of the planet Mars, that they're a little bit more open to sharing what they discover. And you know, I hope we in turn would share our information with them. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's good to have a um, you know a, a, a non political approach to this. And and just share each other's discoveries and knowledge, and and it can only be beneficial holistically for the for the whole world and for for yeah. humanity. But um, sometimes politics gets in the way, and I suppose that's how the whole space race started. It was all centered around the Cold War and politics, and mm. um, that got it off to a kick start. But I, I think I think we've got a much more cooperative approach to it these days. And because you mentioned um, you know taking photos of uh, of the rover on the Chinese. 
uh, on the Martian surface, the Chinese rover. How, how would they feel about that, having a you know uh, <laughs> another country's cameras on them at the at well, the moment? Well, their, their cameras are probably on on our, on us. Most too, things yeah. that we do on Earth. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. You've, yeah, yeah, it's a fair point, but um, yeah, I just but you know, you're right. In the world of science, generally, um, certainly the fundamental sciences like physics and uh, and astronomy, uh, there is a very high level of cooperation, and and part of it is about national pride. Uh, you know, mm. one of the reasons why uh, a lot of Australian scientists work with Chinese scientists, particularly in sciences like physics and things of that sort, is because discoveries might well be made. And if you've got a discovery made in a university in China, that's great kudos for the nation. Um, sure. I guess the, the ultimate in that regard is if uh, Xirong finds unequivocal signs of life on Mars, um, before perseverance does, and that's not impossible. Um, not impossible. You know, it 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 would depend what it was. Uh, it's uh, life is certainly one of the questions that uh, Zhirong is is equipped to try and answer. Uh, looking for it's got ground penetrating radar, looking for subterranean water reservoirs, things of that sort. Uh, you never know what it might turn up. It would be very interesting, and would certainly be a feather in the cap of the China National Space Administration. Well, I'll, I'll be totally honest, Fred. I don't care who finds it. No, I if, don't either. <laughs> I, I just hope, that's you know, right. it's found. And that's because, that, you that see, that's, be that's, that's the scientist in you coming out, Andrew, you, that we want to know. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line with science. We, mm. we are curious. People who want to know are curious in many ways. Absolutely. <laughs> now, I've, I've thought of a question in um, regard to something that we were trying to... Uh, figure out earlier on, which is, you know, what day they were going to roll the rover okay. off the back of the truck, which is basically how they're doing it. And it probably saved them millions of yuan doing it that way. Uh, but, um, and I love the concept of it just sort of going down a couple of ramps off the top of the rover. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> Simplicity in itself. But uh, yeah, so we're talking the, um, the 21st or 22nd of May, but that's Earth calendar. Is there a Martian calendar? Have they developed one? Do we know? <laughs> Um, the, the, yes, um, yes, the, there is. Um, and it's based on Martian days, which are called souls. Martian days, mm. 24 hours, 40 minutes, nearly, more or less. Uh, and it's usually what they usually do. They don't have a calendar in the same way as we do that's the same everywhere. But for every mission, they count the number of days on the surface. So, um, you know, I don't know what it is for Perseverance now. It must be... Uh, Sol 30 or 40 or something of that sort um, yeah. because it's it's been there, you know, actually, no, it would be more than that, be uh, greater than that. But you, you, you get the idea. Uh, you count it from when the when the mission starts or when it lands on the surface. Mm. I, I think that was portrayed well in the movie The Martian because they referred to mission days as, as souls. Uh, and then when, uh, when he... I, I don't want to blow the end, but you know, back on Earth, they referred them, you know, suddenly they were going, bing, day one, uh, yeah. rather than Sol 34 or whatever it was. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. It was good. Um, all right. I just wondered because, you know, um, I suppose uh, the day will come where someone is born on another world and how do you figure out the birth date? I guess you figure out what day it is on Earth and that'll be it. That's the way we do things at the moment, but mm. yeah, it might change. You never know. Might you change. never know. Yeah, fascinating. All right, uh, there will be more to report from the Chinese mission on Mars. Of course, um, I mentioned this last week, but uh, we should mention it again. They've made history because they are now the third nation to uh, land on Mars behind the United States and Russia. So uh, that is just uh, an extraordinary achievement and uh, they should be congratulated, and I'm sure... Uh, most of China is feeling very, very proud at the moment. And that's, uh, you know, we need a good news story given what's been happening in the world the last 18 months or so. Mm -hmm. You're with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson on the Space Nuts podcast. Thanks for joining us. Let's take a break and get a word from our new sponsor, NordVPN. If you're worried about your online privacy, you should be. Surveys across the globe show that the number one concern with internet users is just that, privacy. What you need is a great VPN service. Let me tell you about NordVPN, which I've been trialling for the last week or so. NordVPN is a personal VPN service that secures your internet connection, encrypts your data and hides you from online trackers. 
They offer over 5,000 servers in more than 60 countries to help you bypass local censorship and geo-restrictions. The customer service team is available 24-7 to provide you with assistance with any questions or concerns. And did I mention, they are very fast. You deserve the right to browse the web freely without worrying about who's watching what you do online. With NordVPN, you can make sure nobody can see where you go on the web when using their service, not even them. Get started with our special offer today, save some money, help support Space Nuts and experience true internet freedom for yourself. Go to nordvpn.com slash space nuts or use the coupon code space nuts to get a two year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. That URL again, nordvpn.com slash space nuts or the coupon code space nuts. And I'll put the URL details in the show notes and on our website. Now, back to the show. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now, uh, a reminder, if you would like to visit the Space Nuts website, uh, there are plenty of things to see and do. I've got it open right now, as a matter of fact. And up the top, there are all these little tabs. We call them tabs, but they're actually buttons. But anyway, whatever you like, uh, you can... Click on those and you can get up-to-date news of what's happening uh, in astronomy through Astronomy Daily. There's the AMA tab where you can uh, upload your questions in text or audio. There's the shop. There's a special tab for books. Don't know what's in there. Uh, If you would like to become a supporter of the Space Nuts podcast, there is the supporter page, which you can click on. It says Support Space Nuts, which is you know, what it's for, Uh, and plenty of other things to see and do. And inside the shop, just randomly tapping on that particular, because my internet's so fast, we can talk for the next 10 or 15 minutes before it loads. There we go. Uh, We've got the embroidered (laughs) women's polo shirt. We've got the dad hats. Still wondering about that. We've got the, um, uh, there are shirts there from uh, other podcasts in our stable as well. Uh, there's the uh, T-shirts. There, there's plenty there for you to choose from. Uh, clothing, mugs, stickers, books, the whole bang lot available on the Space Nuts shop on the Space Nuts podcast website. So please check it out. And uh, if you didn't want to become a patron, uh, this is another way of supporting us. Uh, buy yourself a T-shirt or buy someone a T-shirt. If you've got someone who's hard to buy for and you know they're a fan of the show, perhaps, that would be uh, a great gift idea. So uh, check it out at spacenutspodcast.com. Okay, Fred, let us move on to the next topic. I, uh, I read a bit up on this, and this is fascinating. Uh, now, we've talked many times about dark matter and dark energy. Uh, we've also talked about how badly dark energy is named, uh, but uh, we're still trying to figure it out. We don't know what it is or you know, why it exists or, you know, we know it's there because there are just so many blanks in the universe and this stuff congregates in big clusters. A new theory has now been put forward as to um, what might be happening with the expansion of the universe and dark energy. And the thinking now could be that there is a new form of dark energy that is perhaps filling in some of the blanks in the modelling of the expansion of the universe. Have I got that right? (laughs) Yeah, you've left me nothing to say. (laughs) Okay, see you next week. Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, no, that's that's right. Um, uh, You know, just going back to basics, the... uh, the, the two biggest unknowns are dark matter and dark energy, which are quite different. Uh, dark matter is something like ordinary matter, except it's completely invisible and only reveals itself by its gravity. And it outweighs normal matter by about five to one. Uh, but dark energy is the, is it, it, it's not clumpy like dark matter is. For a start, dark energy is a property of space itself. It's everywhere. Uh, and we think it um, it's probably uniformly distributed throughout the universe. That's the easiest assumption that you can make, and that's what cosmologists do. They they mm-hmm. take the most straightforward uh, uh, line because it's the only one you can usually. So, um, yeah. and it, it's when you when you look at the the large scale picture of the universe, you can <clears throat> buy. By looking, for example, at the way galaxies are distributed and things of that sort, you can tease out the relative proportions of each. And 
Uh, it seems funny adding energy to mass, which we do, but or, or t- taking them in the same sort of equation. But of course, matter and energy are equivalent in by E equals mc squared. Yeah. So we end up with a picture where, and this is very rough, but roughly 70% of the mass energy budget of the universe is dark energy. That's the stuff that's making the universe expand more rapidly. Uh, 20% yeah. of it is dark matter and 5% is the stuff we can see, which is mostly hydrogen. Uh, almost all of that is hydrogen. So it, that, those are the proportions. So we're dealing with the unknown quantity that is the biggest of them all, the dark energy. And it, it really is a big mystery. Um, so because we're not really able yet to say what dark energy is, what astronomers have done is concentrated on how it behaves, how how does it reveal itself, what are its properties. And yep. the simplest model of dark energy is what's called the cosmological constant. Uh, and this is something Einstein introduced, actually, into an equation uh, back in the 1920s, uh, because his equations of relativity made the universe expand or contract. It was unstable. And at that time, he didn't know that the universe was expanding because it was before Edwin Hubble's discovery in 1929. So yeah. he introduced this thing called the cosmological constant, which was a, you know, it's a, it a clodge. It's a fix in the equations to stop it, to stop the universe from expanding or contracting. Uh, but equally, it could make it expand or contract uh, even more. And that's how it's v- visualized now. So the name is Einstein's The Cosmological Constant. But mm. what it um, is inferred as is, a, is an energy which is proportional to the amount of space you've got. So uh, basically, for every you know cubic meter of space, you've got a certain amount of this cosmological constant energy and as the space expands you get more energy that's that's the bottom line you know the space is getting bigger so the energy gets bigger as well and that's what's called you know what gives rise to the um the accelerated expansion of the universe so that's the background on dark energy hope you got that (laughs) yeah yeah, Uh, (laughs) but the story now cuts to Another problem that we face in cosmology, and that is uh, that you can you can check these parameters that I've just been talking about, the, the relative mass of uh, or the relative energy content of dark energy, dark matter and normal matter. You can check them by l- looking at the, the way, uh, you know, f- for example, the, the, the small changes or small differences in temperature in the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the flash of the Big Bang, which is slightly rippled because of the unevenness in temperature in that Big Bang. And we think that's due to the sound waves that were pulsing in the in the Big Bang itself. So uh, by looking at those ripples, you can work out these parameters. And in particular, you can work out what the expansion of the universe should be now. You can get that from these numbers. But you can also work that out by looking at distant supernovae, exploding stars, which is actually how we found out that dark energy exists in the first place. So you've got these two ways of understanding the expansion of the universe. One comes from six, uh, four, four, sorry, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. That's when the cosmic microwave background was sort of laid down. That's what we're seeing. We're looking back so far. We see, still see this flash of the Big Bang, which is now in the microwave spectrum. So you can mm. do it with those, and you can do it at what is not quite the present time, but is certainly within a few billion years of the present time by looking at these supernovae. And the problem is you get different answers. Yeah. Um, they're not they're not wildly different. I have to say, I can't remember what the difference is, is but it's in the region of three or four percent, maybe a bit more than that, maybe five percent, mm. which by modern standards is quite significant. So when when I was involved in cosmology back in the 1970s, an error of 100 percent was was acceptable because nobody knew what was going on. But now we've um, we've entered an era of precision cosmology. That's a phrase that was used by my PhD supervisor, Malcolm Longair, the then Astronomer Royal for Scotland, 
who decreed in a meeting one day, we are entering this great phase of precision cosmology. Sorry, Malcolm, if you're listening, that's a very poor impersonation <laughs> of your voice, but uh, precision cosmology, and that's where we are now. So an error of, you know, four or five percent or whatever it is, is significant and it's worrisome. And so scientists have been worried about that. Now, yeah. to come to the story, are you still with me, Andrew? Uh, I am. <laughs> got to sleep, got bored and wandered off. The story no. itself starts here because uh, scientists at the University of Southern Denmark have, have looked at this issue, the, the fact that uh, the, the expansion rate of the universe, you get a different answer for it depending on where you, what, what time scale you're looking at. Uh, and they have introduced something which they call... Uh, new Early Dark Energy. Uh, it, okay. it's, it's got an acronym, which I love. It's NEEDY. Uh, we've got a cat that's NEEDY. Uh, so maybe it's <laughs> something to do with... <laughs> with well, cats are made of dark energy, you know yeah, that. They are. They're all NEEDY, that's right. <laughs> but New Early Dark Energy, what they're suggesting, um, this group of scientists, is that there is uh, a, a different sort of dark energy which was prevalent in the early universe, that's the needy, the new early dark energy. Um, and then at a particular time in the expansion of the universe, it settled down into being the dark energy that we measure today. And if you mm. plug that into your equations, then the problem goes away, as you, as you might expect, because you're changing the nature of dark energy. But what they liken it to is... Uh, a phase change. And by that I mean, uh, by a phase change, we mean, for example, in the case of water, uh, water can go from ice to a liquid, and that is a phase yep. change. It changes its phase. And so what they're suggesting is that maybe this early kind of dark energy, the needy stuff, uh, was a different phase from the dark energy that we see today. And so they uh, imagine a transition between the two at some stage in the universe uh, where... Uh, in fact, what they uh, in one of the scientists, um, I can I can read what he what he said, Martin Slot. Uh, it is a phase transition where many bubbles of the unif new phase suddenly appear, and when these bubbles expand and collide, the phase tr transition is complete. On a cosmic scale, it is a very violent quantum mechanical process. That's what he says about it. So mm. it's uh, re really an interesting idea that we've got two different kinds of dark energy, uh, but they're related to one another in the same way as ice and water are both water, but they're in different phases. Yeah. Um, and, um, well, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how the cosmology community, uh, the astrophysicists who think about the big picture stuff in the early universe, how they react to this. And um, mm. I <clears throat> will be speaking to one of them over the internet tomorrow. I might, I might throw this one his way and ask him what he thinks yeah, of it. Yeah. A very respectful Well, it's clever, it's clever thinking, actually. Yeah, it uh, is, because, yeah. you know, on the surface, you, you generally think of one possibility and, and you, you get fixated on that. So Indeed, for someone to do. say, hang on a minute, you know, there might have been a different kind of yeah. dark energy at some point. And who's to say there aren't more than one now? I mean, you, you know, using the water analogy, yeah, water is a liquid, water is a solid, but it's also available in gas and vapour. Yeah. So, you know, yep. if, water, if water's got multiple functionalities like that, so many other things probably do too. Indeed. I mean, they rock, do. rock can be a liquid if the conditions are right. Oh, it can. <clears throat> That's right. Mm, indeed. All right. Well, we watch with interest. Uh, we're chipping away at this dark matter, dark energy <laughs> puzzle. <laughs> uh, I still find it hard to get my head around the fact that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate in all directions. Um, and, you know, what's filling the space? <laughs> and More space. It, it's, it, it's sort of a self... Um, generating scenario, isn't it? Um, a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you like. It's just, it is happening. We know it. But uh, so many mysteries surrounding the whys and wherefores, uh, which we are we're going to answer. We'll have that answer for you next week, in fact. <laughs> Possibly in your dreams, not. Andrew. <laughs> yes, indeed. <clears throat> we might have the needy uh, bit by next week. But <laughs> yeah, although I've got to say, a couple of times over the years, we've said, now, we don't know why this is happening, but uh, one day we'll know. And then a week later, we've had the answer. That yeah, has happened yeah. to us, I think, twice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
but yeah, uh, yeah maybe not <clears throat> on this occasion. That's anyway, right. uh, there will be probably more theories and hopefully uh, some answers with uh, dark energy in the future. I don't know how far into the future that might be, though. This is the Space Nuts podcast. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, uh, Hugh sent us a, an interesting email this week, which I, I thought was worth a mention. It's basically an analysis of uh, people's activities when it comes to listening to podcasts like ours. And they've basically ranked all of the space-related podcasts. And I'm very happy to say that we've made the top 10, which I, uh, I'm i gobsmacked about. Uh, I, there are some other fantastic podcasts in there, and uh, I do like to recognise um, other people who, who do what we do because... Um, yeah, you know, it's become the new wave of spreading information. The the, the number one space podcast. I, I just love this. This is from NASA. It's called Houston. We have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Uh, and and the list goes on. Uh, you know, and a lot of these are interview based podcasts, and um, uh, others are just sort of chinwaggers like us. Uh, I think what sets us apart to a certain degree, Fred, is uh, audience participation because we do invite people to send us questions and to use their own voices in doing so. But out of the um, uh, space-related podcasts that are being downloaded around the world right now, we come in at number eight and we're the only Australian space podcast in the top ten, which I think is fantastic. I am so thrilled uh, that we're um, receiving that that sort of recognition, and uh, I'm I'm you know I'm chuffed, really chuffed. So uh, thank you to all our supporters who've put us there, because without you, we'd be just two old blokes sitting around <laughs> talking to each other, yeah. which for the first three years was exactly. We were, what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's good. Uh, and um, also, uh, you know, that that sort of support is reflected in some of the social media. Uh, activity that we have with uh, the Space Nuts podcast group that was created by the audience and the the um, the idea of signing up patrons to financially support the podcast was a listener idea. So uh, thank you again. Uh, we are we are so so thrilled. Now speaking of uh, audience participation, Fred, we have some questions. The first one comes from Scouser, who I believe is also a character in a Super Mario game. But uh, Scouser is in Kansas and he says, uh, I'm assuming he, could be a she. Hey guys, just stumbled across this podcast concept last year while avoiding the noise on TV surrounding the political bleep um, here in the US. Anyway, I heard Andrew begging for questions. I don't beg. I probably ask politely. Uh, I heard Andrew asking politely for questions on the drive home from work the other day. So here goes. I think I understand why the observable, observable universe is 93 billion light years in diameter when the universe is only 13.7 billion years old, i.e. the universe expanding faster than the speed of light the further away it is, etc. I suspect the James Webb Space Telescope will uncover a bunch of surprises out there uh, when it comes online soon. But using the telescopes we have now, have we ever observed anything crossing the boundary at the edge of the observable universe? I imagine it's not this simple, but have we ever looked at something at the edge of the observable universe only for it to disappear across the boundary the next time we went looking for it? Thanks. Keep up the good work. I, th I love this question. Uh, because, yeah, that we, we have a limit to how much we can see out into the universe and we don't know what's beyond that. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, only a small percentage of the universe that we can actually observe. But have we ever seen anything that was right out there near the edge and then, whoop, no, nah, it's not there anymore because it's crossed the threshold? Or is that just not possible? It, look, it, it, it would be if the threshold was nearer than it is. <laughs> ah. <clears throat> because um, the horizon, y y the question's quite right in that one of the horizons of the universe is things expanding. Uh, you know, you, you get to a distance where <clears throat> the expansion of the universe is such that the light leaving those objects will never reach us. It will never make it to us. 
Uh, but the, there is a nearer horizon than that, and it's what we've just been talking about. It's the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, and that's the backdrop to the universe. What you're doing is looking back to a time when the universe was still glowing brightly. Um, it, it, it would have been glowing with visible light, in fact, at that time. Uh, but <clears throat> that radiation, as it's travelled through the universe for the last 13.8 billion years, has been stretched into microwaves. So that's what we see. Um, there is uh, there's a kind of subplot to this question, which I might just talk about briefly for a minute. Uh, sure. And Scouser says, I think I understand why the observable universe is 93 point, sorry, 93 billion light years in diameter, when the universe is only 13.7 or 30.8 probably, billion years old. <clears throat> and the, um, th that is to do with the difference between the look back time, uh, which is the 13.8 billion years, and the sort of physical diameter of the universe. So what what's happened is um, the universe has expanded so that uh, if you could see it all at once, and we can't and we never can, uh, the 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 radius of the universe is is you know roughly 45 billion light years um but because we because the universe has been expanding since that time um we uh, we only see it as as though it hadn't expanded in other words we see it at 13.8 billion light years radius so in in fact saying that the universe has a radius an apparent radius of 13.8 billion light years is really misleading uh, and um, the way Scousers put it is much better the universe is 93 billion light years in diameter the universe is only 13.7 billion years old so what you're doing is you're contrasting a physical dimension with a look back time um, right. I, I think I've made a bit of a meal out of that which we might not dwell on but uh, that's the, the difference between those two so what, when we look at <clears throat> the cosmic microwave background as I mentioned a few minutes ago what we see is all these ripples on it slight ripples in temperature at a level of one mm. part in 100,000 <clears> the, the temperature the average temperature is 2.7 degrees above absolute zero and there are variations on that at the level of 0 0.0001 degree <laughs> so um, that's what the ripples are and they uh, we think they were imprinted on the cosmic microwave background um, by sound waves what we call baryonic acoustic oscillations oscillations in the in the the, the, the plasma the the, the glowing mm -hmm. um, brightness of the universe um, so the surface that we see, if you can imagine it, and it's sometimes called the last scattering surface, that surface has these ripples on it, but it itself is moving away from us at the speed of light. This is where it gets really weird. Um, uh, and that's an artifact of what causes that. So what you could say is that, yes, maybe you might see changes in it over time, but the bottom line is that the time that we have available as humans is far shorter than what you would what you'd have to wait for to see any change in the ripples on the cosmic microwave background radiation um it's it's uh, it, that that's sort of turning the question a little bit inside out but that's the situation that we're faced with rather than things crossing the boundary at the edge of the observable universe which we don't see uh, and that's because when we look back to the cosmic microwave background radiation there weren't any discrete objects in the universe at all it was still an amorphous plasma um it was only later when the the first stars and galaxies started coming along so um and uh, you know we can we can s sort of see beyond those in in a sense so we don't see things crossing the boundary but a great question and thank you very much scouser i'm sorry yes, got a bit scouser. tangled there <laughs> took us 10 minutes to tell you no yes that's right did that take 10 minutes i'm so sorry i don't know <laughs> it wasn't that long <laughs> felt like, felt like that an long. hour no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks, Scouser. Lovely to hear from you. Okay, uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. We're going to Western Australia with a question from Gus. Uh, thank you. Love the show. I've been thinking about higher dimension unification theories a lot lately. Could I just stop me there, too. Andrew? Uh, what? Um, are you sure that's not Washington? 
Oh, it could be. <laughs> oh, WA, yeah. Look, WA is that's a good point. Issaquah sounds a yeah. lot more like an North Issaquah American. Issaquah does not than sound like an Australian, Australian place, I must say. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. my apologies, Gus. Uh, I put you in Western Australia. It's a nice place, by the way. <laughs> um, but no, you're in Washington. All right, uh, Gus. Uh, thank you. Um, love the show. I've been thinking about higher dimension unification theories a lot lately. I read a lot about string theory in college. I never quite got the notion of another dimension until presented with the analogy of an ant on a two-dimensional line. Two ants on a 2D line can't cross, but if they can act in another dimension, walk around the line like itself, uh, like one of these proposed additional dimensions, and raise their environment, uh, uh, raise their environment, um, their world to 3D. Uh, that we can't perceive except for the ants crossing each other. Uh, okay, that's the setup to the question. Is this a reasonable candidate for spooky action at a distance? Are we conceivably seeing the ant cross in some way when we talk about quantum coupling? Uh, just a guy who likes thinking about things. Yes, you do. You've got a, an amazing mind. Um, if I hear this on the show, I promise to be super excited. Well, we're excited because Fred's now got to tackle this one. Yeah. No, <laughs> Thanks look, for the a, question, Gus. It, it is a great question. Um, mm. And that's very like uh, the kind of thinking that goes into it. It's it's a bit more subtle than that. But um, so the, the quantum coupling that Gus is talking about is what we normally call quantum entanglement. And maybe you remember that... Um, if you get two subatomic particles that uh, have so much in common that they behave in a quantum fashion just like one particle, and that's what entanglement means, and then you take one a long, long way away and you do something to it, namely look at it, uh, the other one instantaneously reacts. It says, oh, I'm being looked at, and, uh, yeah. and you know, it, it reacts. And that's what Einstein called spooky action at a distance, which is where that quote comes from. So okay. um, so people, I think it's still fair to say, uh, there, are, there are subtleties with that whole thing, actually, but, the, but I think it's fair to say that this is not well understood. And there are certainly quantum physicists who believe that what we're seeing here is evidence of a, of a deeper layer of reality, if I can put it that way, be up below what we, what we perceive in quantum mechanics and what we perceive in relativity, the two basic theories that tell us how the universe works. Um, and so there's this idea that there is new physics. It comes from many other different considerations. But one of the possibilities of new physics is, yes, that there are additional dimensions that we can't perceive. And that analogy that Gus has given is the perfect example of that, the two ants walking on a 2D line uh, that, that suddenly find they're in three dimensions and they cross one another, but we can only see the two dimensions. So it looks as though they've mm. done something really weird, come together and then separated again. V a very nice analogue. Um, uh, uh, several of the current theories uh, of the universe, including string theory, uh, require higher dimensions. In fact, I think s some flavours of string theory require 26 dimensions. And the only th ones we can see are the four of space and time, three dimensions of space and one of time. Um, the uh, One of the ways that string theory gets around this is the idea of what we, what they call compactified dimensions, where the dimensions are actually wrapped up a, 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 around a string that's got essentially zero diameter. It's very strange things to think about. Uh, but there's another version of this called M-theory, which is probably membrane theory or uh, something like that, magic theory, uh, which suggests that um, our perceived dimensions you can think of as membranes on a two-dimensional or dimensions on a two-dimensional sheet, uh, which and, and they exist in a higher dimensional space. And that's, a, I think that's a fairly uh, well-known theory. It's only a theory. There is no evidence whatsoever that this is true, but people are working on it. Uh, but that leads you into the idea that each, you know, there might be multiple universes, each one having its own membrane, uh, which is mm. the, the one of the cornerstones of M-theory. And so, once again, you've got this 
um, that the existence of multiple dimensions, which raises the possibility that these weird quantum effects that we see might be because things are crossing into additional dimensions. This is hand-waving stuff. It's very waffly, um, from me anyway. Uh, a lot of the scientists who are working on this are building very serious mathematical theories to try and explain it but the the thing that's lacking at the moment is evidence we just have no evidence that any of this stuff works except for entanglement which does work yeah i suppose that's your your foothold isn't it into the it whole is, yeah. concept mm. Mm. all right gus from washington i'm going to lobby the washington uh, state government and the west australian state government and see if they can work out a different um way of demonstrating the abbreviated form of each individual state <laughs> because it's not working for me. It's just not. <laughs> well, it's clearly they're not. W, they're both WA. <laughs> and and yeah. we often refer to Western Australia as WA. I don't we know do. if that happens yeah. in Washington. Uh, what I want but, to do uh, just before we go is, yes. in fact, to check if, where is it? Washington, USA. There it is. It's a quote. Ah, you found him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we used a Chinese thing? spy satellite to do that, by the Indeed. way. Indeed. <laughs> Otherwise known as Google Maps. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it looks great, actually. Yes, it's indeed. like a nice part of the world. <laughs> uh, that, that is a beautiful part of the world up around that, um, those northern American yeah. states, the yeah. northwest. Beautiful. Lovely. Northeast is nice, too. In fact, um, most places I've visited in the United States were, were lovely. Uh, even the deserts, uh, they're prettier than ours. Ours are just rock and dust and dirt. Uh, at least you've got some plant life in yours. <laughs> no, we, we, ours aren't too bad either. Every, that's the thing. The, the planets, every, everywhere you go, it's, it's different. Um, although I'm told, I'm told by a friend that uh, has visited uh, Texas that it's very much like the area I live in, out here on the Western Plains. Uh, if you if you plucked someone out of Dubbo and dropped them in Texas, they wouldn't feel like they were anywhere else. It would, you know, because they're so much alike in terms of terrain and grassland, etc. Haven't tested the theory yet, but uh, maybe one day when all this pandemic stuff is over with. Uh, thank you again, Gus. Lovely to hear from you. Sorry about messing up your locality, but um, <laughs> you know, globalization and all, it'll probably all come together in the end. Uh, and thank you, Fred. Uh, always great fun. Nice to see you and chat again, and we'll catch you again uh, next week. Sounds right. Thank you very much, Andrew. Take care. Have a good week. You too. Yeah. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the great big team of 2 Plus 1 here at the Space Nuts podcast, and hello to Hugh in the studio who, well, we don't know what he does, but he's there, which is the main thing. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you for joining us. We'll catch you again next week on another edition of the Space Nuts podcast. Bye for now. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.